All right, people. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown, all published by Simon & Schuster Saga Press. Today, I'm going to be reviewing one of my favorite science fiction trilogies of all time. Well, I'm going to be reviewing book number one in that trilogy, and that is An Abyss of Light by Kathleen M. O'Neill. Now, a lot of you probably know Kathleen O'Neill better from her People of the Raven series, People of the Wolf, People of the Moon, you know, her ancient, her historical novels about ancient America that she co-authored with her husband, W. Michael Gear. So they wrote those. That's what she's most known for. But back in 1990, when this came out, it was her first, first ever published novel, and it was a straight space opera book. And it was magnificent. It's magnificent. I love these. Like I said, one of my favorites of all time. Not only that, but I got to meet the Gears. I got to meet Kathleen O'Neill. She's signed most of my books. You know, I always do that. I always name drop when I meet people. And I always get my books signed by my favorite writers. So let's talk about this. Came out in 1990, this space opera. Epic, gritty, bold, Wicked, awesome space opera came out. Let's talk about the covers. We always discuss the covers. This is a great painting by the artist San Julian. You know, down at the bottom, we've got the spaceship, the exploding planet. Up top, we've got the, one of our characters holding one of the Mia Sharim, one of the crystal balls that they can speak to God through. Overall, great cover. I love the wraparound. We've got these more we've got more of these spaceships here zooming in like Battlestar Galactica vipers zooming into this desert town and blowing things up and then we've got these ancient scrolls down at the bottom. All of those things play important roles in the book itself. I love when I love when the illustrator and the and the graphic designers come together with the author and actually illustrate scenes from the book. It's freaking awesome. You wouldn't think it would be that hard. But there's a lot of books published out there that the covers don't have got jack shit to do with the book. Not so, not here. The uh the typeface, the you know, the the wording in the center eh, is a little wonky, but hey, you're not gonna complain. And then San Julian also did the covers for the sequels. And they're great too. And we'll we'll go over those covers in detail when we review these books too. I was going to read review the whole trilogy just as one big review, but then I was like, I started rereading this, and I'm like, no, each book deserves its own review. Dude, that's how dynamite these things are. Gritty, hard-hitting space opera. If you like that, that's what this is. This stuff is dynamite. I love these books. Reminds me of Dune. Reminds me of a lot of the great, great epic space operas. And, and science fictions. What's it about? Let's talk about what it's about. The best way for this is just for me to read the back copy. Because that's because that they, they, they really do a great job of describing this book. So, they were the chosen people. The gamuts. The gamuts are the chosen people. Or are they? Or are they human pawns in an interdimensional struggle between alien powers? Oh yeah, juicy stuff. I love juicy stuff like this. I love when we get religious philosophy and people who are devout believers and then we get space and science all intertwined with it. Oh, I love it. When the galactic magistrates, aliens with incredible destructive capability, Forced world after world to join their union of solar systems, only the Gamut people continued to resist subjugation. For although the magistrates' union brought peace and prosperity, it also stole individuality of its member races. And to the humans known as the Gamut people, their heritage was more important than life itself. For they were the chosen ones, Blessed with the gift of the Mia Sharim. They were, they're the chosen, the gamuts are the chosen ones. Blessed with the gift of the crystal balls that they can talk to God through. The Mia Sharim are an interdimensional gateway to God. But were the beings of light, 
with whom the wearers of the Mia communed with actually gods and angels? Or were they aliens beyond the comprehension of flesh and blood mortals? Were they a race to whom the gamuts were mere pawns in some universal game? Yeah, so what we've got is our setup is we've got two, several, a handful of religions vying for power in the universe, right? And they've and some of them got the starships. Some of them are just mystical people. Some of them, some of them just worship on their own planets. Others of them are overtaking the solar systems and the galaxies with their starships. I mean, we've got all these different factions vying for political power in this universe. And then we got the gamut people who carry around these little crystals. And there's not very many of them. And so the whole story, the whole trilogy, it's more, it's kind of like hot potato with the uh, magic crystals that you can speak to God. It's like hot potato, like who has one? Like who stole one from who? Like who betrayed who to get one? Like who assassinated who to get one? Like they keep changing hands all over the place, right? And it's just like, who, who's got the one? Who's got them next? And do they really speak to God? And some people are speak, they're speaking to somebody. You know, they're speaking to somebody. When you read the book, they're speaking to something out there. But what is it? And it, does it mean them good or does it mean them bad? And it's like, it's, I just love this kind of thing where we get people that are so embroiled in their religions that, you know, it causes wars, it causes strife, it causes political struggle, it causes death and human suffering. And we get all of that in this space opera. And, uh, oh, I just love it. I love this kind of stuff. I love this kind of writing. And not only that, but it's just gritty, dark, bloody fun. I mean, it's R-rated. So if, you, if you're afraid of R, if you like, if you like your uh, space operas, like, nice and PG, this ain't for you. This got some stuff in it. This has some stuff in it that will uh, curdle your toes. But that's the kind of stuff I like, man. I don't mind. I don't mind the rated R. I know a lot of you are sensitive to the rated R. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sensitive to the rated R. So some of the main characters. Uh, one of our mainest characters is Jeremiel Baruch. He's a starship captain. Um, he's, he's second in command. Rudy Copel. They get embroiled in this religious stuff, and Jeremiah Baruch. Jeremiah Baruch kind of hooks up with Rachel and her little daughter Sybil, and Rachel is fleeing you know, the destruction of her planet. So the starships are destroying, people are destroying, there's a lot of terrorism. There's a lot of religious fervor and religious terrorism in these books. Um, and it all revolves around, you know, these messiahs like Adam and Michael and Ephraim and all of these messiahs and the Mia stones and the, and there's these portals to speak to gods, but are they really speaking to gods? Or are they just speaking to people that are fucking with them? Right? I don't know. We don't find out until, you know, I mean, it's, it's all great mysteries. It's all just layered mystery. The plot is really thick and the mysteries are layered so well in this. And the characters are so well drawn out. And I just love everybody from the starship captains to just the regular worshippers on the ground. And, and a lot of it does take place on planet. Like I would say about 80% of this book, rather than taking place in starship battles and stuff, it takes place on a couple of different planets. I mean, we've got... We've got the planet Kayan, I think it's called, um, where the leader of the Gamut people keeps the Mia Shireem, or these little crystals. He, he kind of keeps those. And then we also have the desert world of Horeb, um, where the old believers um, are on the brink of rebellion, and they're just, uh, their high councilman, Oranias, is, um, you know, he's trying to become the true Messiah to everybody. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of, like, it's like a lot of, like, religious things like that and then there's another starship captain coltan who um he's got to face a lot of things like do i do genocide on on all these gamuts or i mean what it's just it's got a lot of cool stuff in it a lot of cool stuff and i will admit if you're interested in these now this is just a secret between me and you if you're interested in these they came out in 1990 they were semi-popular at the time but then kathleen o'neill's People of the Wolf books just became such huge bestsellers. These sort of dropped, faded away into obscurity a little bit, and they're now they're hard to find. So if you want to get this series, you're not going to be able to go get it at the bookstore. You're going to have to go onto eBay or find them in used bookstores because they're real, really very rare now. 
But if you do get them, I'm telling you, you're going to be on an adventure just that competes every with every great science fiction from Dune to Alistair Reynolds to Peter F. Hamilton to Stephen R. Donaldson to, you know, Pierce Brown, all of the uh, the Expanse, all of it. This is this competes right up there with all of them. I give this first book an Abyss of Light, a nine out of ten. I just think it's dynamite. I can't read, wait to read these other two and leave reviews for you soon.